Well, welcome to step three of our growth track. If you uh, need a booklet, why don't you just uh, raise your hand so that uh, our host can take care of that for you. Um, and while we're getting all that together, no matter which campus you're uh, part of today, uh, I want to remind you of what we're all doing here because the, the purpose of our growth track is to help you on a spiritual journey to receive what God had in His heart for you from the beginning of time all through the scriptures, you can see that God always wanted you to have a relationship with Him. That's why we call that first step knowing God. Uh, then after we know Him, we have to take some steps to get beyond our past. We all have a past. And uh, we call that step find freedom. And then after we find freedom, uh, it's time for us to discover your purpose. Uh, because we're not here just to exist or to survive. We're here to do something that really matters, something that really makes a difference. And you can't do that if you don't know what your purpose is. You can't know uh, what it is if you haven't discovered the reason for which God puts you on the planet. And so after we help you to discover your purpose, then ultimately, and I, I really believe this with all of my heart, the highest level of living is where you are making a difference. Uh, in fact, sociologists say that the highest level of fulfillment for any human being is when you can go to sleep at night knowing that you've done something that helped to change someone else's life. And uh, we really believe that that's God's plan. We call it know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. That really is His plan for your life. Now, each one of those four steps has a system that we use to deliver it to you. Uh, for instance, uh, meeting God, knowing God, drawing closer to God, that happens primarily through our Sunday services at CLC. Then secondly, the, the idea of finding freedom. I've heard so many testimonies through the years of people that, that found freedom through small group ministries like uh, Cleansing Stream or Celebrate Recovery, or Divorce Care, or any number of our regular life groups, because in those groups, you'll have people who care about you, people who will become your friend, and most importantly, people with whom you can share your heart. Because James 5.16 told us that if we confess our faults one to another and pray for one another, that we can be healed. I've taught on this several times, but uh, the scripture is very clear. We confess our sins to God so we can be forgiven. But it's also important for us to confess them to each other so we can be fully healed, so that we can overcome those sins or those faults and, and move forward in healing. And so uh, someone else has very, very wisely said that you are only as sick as your secrets. It's important for you to have people in your life, every one of us, to have people in our lives with whom we can be totally open, share our faults, share our sins, and know that they will love us anyway and that they will pray for us, and hold us accountable, and help us to overcome those things. Uh, and then after you find freedom, uh, the, the third part of, of that, the third step there is delivered through this growth track, the, the very class that you're in. Uh, and that's discovering your purpose. Uh, hopefully, when you do all of that, you will continue to the final phase of the journey where you are making a difference in the lives of others. And that happens by joining our dream team and using your gifts to serve other people. Now, the growth track, as I mentioned, has four steps. Week one is so important that you get connected to a local church body. Uh, hopefully, you've already done that. You've already joined CLC. And if not, I hope that you're at least contemplating that. That's why you're here today. Maybe you've planned to go through the entire uh, four steps of growth track to, to make sure that this is the church for you. But whatever you are, wherever you are in that journey, I, I want to emphasize again how important it is for you to be planted in a local church. The Psalms tells us that he that is planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of God. So I really want to encourage you to do that if you've not already done so. And then last week in the step two class, we talked about the fact that you have a design. 
Uh, God wired you in a certain way. Ephesians put it like this, to each one of us a grace gift has been given. Uh, that grace gift in your life is something that you just, you're just automatically going to be motivated to do. You, just, you have a drawing, an inclination for that. Um, and it tells us how you were wired, how God made you in the first place. Uh, the more you look into a person's design, the more you can see their destiny. Uh, and that's why last week we gave you that uh, personality profile and that spiritual gifts profile to help you and to help us to understand how it is that God has made you so that we will know uh, what, how he wants to use you and what his plan is for your life. And so today we're going to move into the next step in the development of your purpose and we're going to start with a verse that's in your booklet. I'm going to page 37, if you'll open there. And uh, page 37, I'll get to it in just a second. First <laughs> uh, Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, right at the top of the page, says, God has given each of you a gift. You know, I, I've had people try to argue with me when I, when I discuss that, but, and they say, I, I don't have a gift, I'm not gifted, I'm not good at anything. But your argument's not with me as a pastor. Your argument is with God and His Word because 1 Peter 4 and 10 says, God has given each of you, no exceptions, each of you has received a gift. Hopefully last week when you took the gifts profile, uh, you were able to discover, maybe for the first time, that you were able to recognize a gift or perhaps even more than one gift that God has placed in you. God has given each of you a gift, he goes on to say, from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Um, the truth is, there is such a variety, and all of us are wired differently. Uh, all of us are motivated differently. But then the most important part of the verse, the part that is emphasized every time gifts are discussed in Scripture is this, use them well to serve one another. The important thing is not just knowing that you have a gift. The important thing is that you're doing something with your gift, that you're using it to make a difference in the lives of others. And I know from past experience, people sometimes say, uh, Jerry, I'm just, I'm not ready for that. I, I, need, to, I need to sit a little bit longer. Um, or, or they say things like, well, God is still working on me. Well, I hope that he is. I hope that he's still working on all of us. Uh, but we often disqualify ourselves because we have a wrong concept of serving. We have a wrong concept of leadership, a wrong definition maybe of leadership. Uh, John Maxwell, I don't know if you've heard of him, but John was a, a pastor for many years and is a best-selling New York Times author. Uh, Chris and I have had the privilege of of uh, traveling for his ministry. We are associate trainers with his ministry. And John uh, describes leadership simply as influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is influence. And if you understand that, then surely you understand that all of us are leaders in some respect because all of us have influence. You have influence with some people in this world. And uh, what we want to talk about is how we can develop that influence and, and make it even greater than it may currently be. Uh, leadership, influence is not dependent on a title. You don't have to have a title to, to be influential. You don't have to have a position to be influential. Uh, in fact, it's not dependent on your natural abilities. And I would encourage you, don't ever limit yourself just to your natural abilities. But rather, that kind of influence that I'm talking about is dependent on you discovering your gifts and passions and then using them to make a difference in the lives of others. Uh, here, here's what I've noticed in Scripture, maybe you have as well, that God very seldom uses talented people. <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, he uses people who have issues, or as my pastor sometimes says, issues. Yeah. Uh, he does. I mean, think about it. He used Moses to deliver his people Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And yet Moses was a murderer and perhaps a stutterer. But God chose him anyway. In the New Testament, the greatest of all the apostles was the man named Paul. But before his conversion, he went around killing other Christians. 
And yet God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Or consider the man that God says was a man after his own heart, King David. But we know his story and we know that David was an adulterer. So why did God choose people like that? Why would he use murderers and, and, and people who committed adultery? Why would he use people like that? I think there's one simple reason. He did that to show us that he can even use people like us. He doesn't expect us to be perfect, uh, but God wants to use us. The problem is there's usually something standing in our way, and oftentimes it's how we see ourselves. Uh, that story of God's call to Moses in Exodus chapters 3 and 4 is one that I find very interesting, not just because uh, it's good reading about Moses, but because it reveals a lot about us too, because Moses had an awful view of himself. And I think that's a, that's a real key, is for us not to see ourselves the way we think we are, but to see ourselves the way God views us. When God called Moses and said, uh, I want you to deliver my people. Moses' response was, who am I that, that I should go to Pharaoh and say uh, that, that God wants to deliver them? And God quickly told him, it's right here in your notes, in, uh, in verse 11 of Exodus 3, God says, I will be with you. He's not expecting us to do something on our own. If so, then maybe it would be about our ability. But God says, I will be with you. But even with that, I want you to notice, we'll take a little time and see that there were four excuses that Moses made, four things that kind of stood in the way to keep him from using his gifts and being the man that could deliver Israel. And I think they all have a bearing on us today. The first one he said was, who am I? In your notes, I would encourage you to write this down, write insecurity. Because that's what Moses was expressing. Who, who am I? I'm, I'm no one great. And sometimes we let our own insecurities uh, disqualify us from serving and using the gifts that God has given us. Not only that, but uh, uh, Moses' next excuse, if you keep reading in Exodus, he says, but Lord, uh, what if the children of Israel, what if they don't believe me? What if they make fun of me? What if, the, the what ifs, what if they, and, and I would describe that if you want to write it in your notes, I would say that was fear speaking, fear. What if people laugh at me? What if people make fun of me? Uh, what, what will I do if they do this? You know, it's that fear of man. And you know what the Bible says? The book of Proverbs says the fear of man is a trap. And so don't let fear of what someone else may say or think stand in your way. The third excuse that Moses had uh, was, he said, God, I have never, I've never been good at speaking is what he said in, in particular. Uh, but, but I want you just to, to notice that first part. I have never fill in the blank. You know what Moses was expressing there? He was expressing his comfort zone. You know why God is famous for calling us out of what's familiar to us? It's because he wants us to be dependent on him. And when you've never done something before, you're much more likely to depend on him who called you instead of on your own abilities. And then finally, uh, when all of his excuses failed and, and God had answers for every one of them, finally Moses just said, use someone else. And his expression there of saying, can't you use Aaron, let my brother be the one, was expressing his reluctance, if you want to write that in the blank. Um, you know, the enemy will put things in our way. He'll put obstacles in your path as well. Oftentimes, it's one of two things. It's either possessions that he puts in your place, that, that you have stuff, that maybe you've got great job, maybe you've got lots of money and, and it's like, I, I don't have time, I can't possibly serve because I, you know, I've got too much going on on my own. Or he may fill your life with problems. So you say, I just don't see how I can do that with all that's, all that's coming against me right now. But whether it's possessions or problems or something else entirely, the truth is you will never be as fulfilled as God intended until you learn to use your gifts in serving others. You know, the first part of our life really until we find him is all about finding him, knowing God. 
But once we meet Jesus, once we know him, then really life is all about making a difference in this world, making a difference with someone else. Uh, I want to read the verse at the bottom of page 37 as well. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Do you, do you get that? Do you, do you know what God is saying? Let's, let's put it in, in our terms today. He was saying, you're a minister. See, we believe that at CLC. We believe that every person is a minister, not just the pastors, but all of us are ministers. All of us have a calling. All of us have giftings that God wants to use. He goes on to say, you are a holy nation, his own special people, and then the most important word in the verse is the next verse, of the next word, which says that. Here's why you are chosen by God. Here's why you are a minister. Here's why you're a holy nation, his own special people, so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason God has called you is because he wants to use you. And as you proclaim his greatness, you are helping others to come out of their darkness into his marvelous light. You can make a difference. And so no matter what stands in your way today, I would encourage you by faith to realize there really is leadership inside you. There really is influence. There really is giftings and callings on the inside of you. And when you start using your influence to help others, you'll find the joy that God always intended for your life. Okay, let's go to the top of page 38 now. And, and I want to show you a, a picture of what a real leader looks like. Um, as I said already, it's not about titles or about positions. And I keep saying that because so many times in so many churches, especially churches around Chicagoland, it seems, uh, I've noticed that, that people think I've got to have a title or I've got to have a position. I, uh, this is how I earn my my self-worth. It's, it's how I gain in my own view of myself. But the reality is leadership is not about titles or about positions. It's really not even about our abilities most of the time. Now, I'll admit, if, if what you feel called and gifted to do is to, uh, to be on the worship team, then it is important that you have some ability. I mean, uh, if, you, uh, if your singing would qualify you for the American Idol blooper tape, then you probably aren't going to be on our praise team, okay? You do have to have some abilities for some ministries. But for the most part, what qualifies you to be a leader and to have influence in the kingdom of God is not your ability, but the qualities in your life. I want you to notice uh, this in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, right there at the top of page 38. Um, it says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps. Uh, those were uh, leaders. I don't know why we, we can't just use that word. He appointed 120 leaders to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Notice this verse. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. Uh, one translation says, by his excellent spirit that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And I want to encourage you uh, with some exceptional qualities that we value here at Christian Life Center. If you want to have influence, if you want to make a difference in the lives of others, these are the values or the qualities that, that we especially esteem at our church. First of all, we love God. That, that's it. Just in your blank, just write, love God. Because the truth is, all ministry is an overflow of relationship. Uh, the number one gift that you have is not what you do when you when you choose later to get involved in an area of ministry, maybe you're serving with the kids or maybe you're helping in the parking lot or, or maybe you're playing an instrument on stage or maybe you're running a camera for us. Your number one value to us and your, your gift to us is not what you're doing. It's not running a camera or, or helping the kids or helping park cars. Your number one gift is the fact that you love God because your love 
has a way of being contagious. It overflows on those people you serve, whether it's in the parking lot or in the nursery or on stage. Your love for God overflows to others, and that's what makes it so contagious. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13 bears that truth out because it says, uh, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Now, the Greek word, you might find this interesting, uh, the Greek word for ordinary is the word idiotes, which is where we get our English word idiots. <laughs> so even if you've ever felt like an idiot, I know I have sometimes, the truth is they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Even if you're untrained, even if you feel like an idiot, people can recognize when you truly love God, that you've spent time with Jesus. Next week, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to choose which team that you're going to serve on. And I wanna reiterate again that what you do on that team is important, but what's most important is that your love for God overflows and touches others, touches everyone on those, on those teams and everyone that you serve on those teams. Now I want to share with you on each of these values that we're going to talk about that, that we hold so dear, I want to talk about three things that you need to do as a result. So in talking about loving God, I would encourage you to, first of all, develop your relationship with God. That's what goes in the first blank there. Uh, wherever you are, wherever you are in your relationship with God, make it your goal to get closer. That's really what, what Christian Life Center is about. It's helping people to get closer to God. Uh, secondly, develop your character. Uh, your love for God should affect the character of your life, and so you want to develop that. Uh, Psalm 139, David prayed a very dangerous prayer that I would encourage you to pray as well. He, he said, search me, O God, and see if there's something in me that, that is not pleasing to you. Uh, and, and that's a good prayer for any leader, any person who wants to have influence to pray uh, because we need to deal with any character issues that we have. So don't think you've arrived, but instead develop your character. And then thirdly, develop your calling. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, become the best at that that you can possibly be. I've been preaching for almost 50 years now, but I want to tell you, I probably work harder on that and spend more time during the week trying to develop my ability to communicate God's Word so as to touch people effectively with the Word of God. So whatever your gift is, whatever your calling is, get better at it, work at it, so that you can become uh, even better in fulfilling what God has called you to do. Okay, the second uh, quality that we value at CLC is not only do we love God, but number two there in your, in your notes is we love people. So important, not only to love God, but to love people. Now, that may come naturally for, for some of you. If you're, if you're one of the sanguines among us, you know, you love everybody. It's just, it's easy for you to love people. Others of us, uh, maybe we have to work at it. I'm I'm a phlegmatic. It's, I'm just kind of laid back, you know, uh, withdrawn sometimes. And uh, uh, being people-oriented does not come naturally for me. I'm more task-oriented. But I learned a long time ago in one of the first churches that I served uh, how important a person's name was to them. And I made it a point way back then to, to learn the names of people in the, in the congregation because I noticed that when I used their name, it, uh, it brought a smile to their face. And all of these years later, now, I will be the first to tell you, my reputation far exceeds reality. I've had people in the past uh, introduce a first-time guest to me at CLC, and they would tell their guests, now, you watch next week when you come back, you'll know your name. And I, I say, please don't say that anymore, because the more names that I've learned over the years, I think my hard drive is full, and every time I learn a new name, it kicks out one of the old ones. So maybe it's that, or maybe it's just my age. But the reality is, I know that people are important. I love people, and so I make it a point to try and and live in such a way that people will know that I care. So that's the second area that we, we especially value. Jesus uh, said it like this in Mark chapter 10. He said, you know those who are regarded as rulers 
uh, of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. He said some people are just interested in influence or leadership uh, for what it'll do for them. They want that power. But I want you to notice what Jesus said, not so with you. And that's how we feel at CLC. We are not interested in having leaders or people of influence just because they're trying to climb some ladder at CLC. No. Our purpose for serving is because we care about people. Okay. Page 39 then at the top of the page. Let's talk about what it means to really love people. And here's the first one, if you fill in the blank. Be a servant doesn't matter if you're working in the nursery or the parking lot or if you're on stage or if you're leading a life group or whatever ministry you choose to be a part of. Whatever you're doing, let your love for people overflow by serving them. The way we sometimes say it is find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. But when you really love people, the best way to demonstrate that is to become a servant, to do what is needed. Uh, secondly, we really want to encourage you to be a team player. Uh, our culture here at CLC is one of, of unity and teamwork. We're not interested in, in uh, lone rangers who want to be all-stars. We want to be a team player. Choose we over me. And then thirdly, I really want to encourage you when it comes to loving people to be real. Be honest and transparent. I would say that my greatest quality as a pastor is sincerity. There are lots of men that can preach better than me. I'm sure there are lots of men that can lead better than me. But I don't know that anyone can out-sincere me. And I would encourage you also to be real in your love for people. And then Thirdly, we pursue excellence. I want you to notice Mark 7 and 37. It says, people were overwhelmed with amazement, talking about Jesus. He has done everything well, they said. And that, that describes what we want for every ministry and every work at CLC. We want to pursue excellence in all that we do. Uh, three ways, three suggestions there. First of all, for your notes, do things well. I know in many churches it seems like 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work, and I've, I've been a part of congregations where, you know, just a few volunteers seem to be doing everything, and they were overworked, and that affected their performance. I would much prefer that you do fewer things, but that you do them well, do them with excellence. Secondly, do them before you are asked. I tell you, I love initiative. In fact, before I was uh, coming to teach this lesson today, uh, we, it was time for reviews with our staff, and, and our executive pastor came to me about someone and said, uh, we're considering him for a, a bigger raise than what, uh, what we normally would, would give. And uh, I saw the number and I said, yeah, what is the reason for that? And he'd started describing some of the things that this person had done. And then he said, and by the way, he did that without anybody asking him. He took initiative. And when I heard that, I said, let's give him the raise because I love initiative. Initiative is a mark of people of excellence. They don't wait for someone to point out what needs to be done. If they see a piece of litter or trash in the parking lot, they don't say, that's not my job. They take the initiative to take care of it. And then thirdly, they do more than is expected. I love that story in the book of Genesis where uh, Rebecca uh, provided water to, uh, to the servant, uh, but he, she didn't just provide water for him, for Abraham's servant, but she also said, I will bring water for all of your camels. That was quite a task to feed those thirsty camels. But the point is she went beyond what was expected of her, and because she did, because she did more than was expected, she wound up being in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. She got into his bloodline. And so I would encourage you, don't just do exactly what's expected of you, but do more than is expected. That's, that's a real servant. And then fourthly, 
the final quality that I want to share with you today that we value so highly at CLC is that we choose joy. And when I say we choose joy, I'm talking about your attitude. Some of you may have heard the name of Zig Ziglar, who's been around for many years in America, and he made the statement that your attitude more than your aptitude determines your altitude. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cute way of saying it, I guess. But really, what he was saying is that your attitude will take you further in life than just about anything else. It'll take you further than your abilities. And I think we've all known people like that. We've known people who had great abilities, but they didn't prove to be successful because of a bad attitude. Attitude especially shows up when you don't feel like having a good attitude. In fact, I think attitude is the X factor at, at any church. Uh, the Apostle Paul went to prison for his faith, but he chose to have a good attitude. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, he said, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Paul chose to have a good, positive attitude no matter what circumstances he was in. You know, when my kids were small, which was many years ago now, uh, they loved Winnie the Pooh, and we would read Winnie the Pooh books to them, it seems like, every day. Uh, but my favorite character in those Winnie the Pooh stories was Tigger, because Tigger was always positive. He was always saying, yes. Didn't matter what the question was, his answer was, yes. And everybody loves someone with that kind of attitude. When it comes to choosing that attitude of joy, let me mention three things there. First of all, be enjoyable. Uh, what do I mean by that? Take responsibility for the atmosphere of the room. If you're serving in a particular area of ministry and, and maybe things aren't going so well or people seem like they're downtrodden or whatever, take responsibility to change that atmosphere. You know, An usher can make the difference in someone's week just by how he treats them, how he smiles, you know, how he greets them. Uh, we can make a difference with our attitude. Secondly, I would encourage you to be positive. I've challenged our staff sometimes. You know, our, our default, when anybody comes to us about anything, our default should be yes. Now, you may have to work to find a way not to say no, but don't let no be the first thing out of your mouth. Find a way to be positive. I've also told our staff, don't ever bring a problem to me without also thinking it through and coming up with an alternative, coming up with a, a possible solution so that when you bring me the problem, you can say, but I think we could do this or this in order to solve that. That's the kind of positive attitudes that, that we all want to see. And then thirdly, be loyal. You know, in ministry as well as life, uh, we may go through some hard times, but let's make sure that we don't bail, that we are loyal to one another. You know, those four values that I just shared with you are borne out by the four Gospels. Did you ever wonder why there's four of them? You know, why, why is the life and ministry of Jesus in the New Testament given to us by four different men with four different views? And, and I would simply explain to you, it's because they were writing for a different audience and for a different purpose. For instance, John told us in his writings that he was trying to show us through what he wrote that Jesus is God. And, and he was trying to describe that in every way, even in the genealogies. The other genealogies, you know, trace the bloodline of Christ through Abraham or the bloodline of Christ through Adam. But John went all the way back and says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, so he was writing to show us that Jesus is God. And that's our first value, first, uh, first quality at CLC that we especially value, that we are going to love God more than anything else. And then the, the, the second gospel of Luke, uh, he shows us that Jesus is a son. He's not just uh, God, but he's also a man. And he writes from that very human perspective about Christ. And our second quality that we especially value is that we love people, just as Luke showed us that human side of Christ. And then 
Matthew, uh, if you've ever noticed, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, and that's why he quoted so many Old Testament prophecies. He would tell us Jesus did this in order to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, or he did this in order to fulfill what the prophet said. So many times he was quoting those Old Testament prophecies, and, and so I think he becomes a good example of our third uh, quality that we value so much of excellence because God did things with excellence. He not only predicted the future, but he fulfilled every one of those prophecies to the last detail. And then Mark, of course, he wrote to the Romans who were uh, only impressed with action. That's what they were concerned about. And so his, his gospel is the shortest one, but it's packed with action of Jesus healing and Jesus miracles and Jesus changing bad situations into good. Isn't that what an attitude will do for us? It'll take a bad situation and turn it into good. Those are the things that, that really mark us as a church, the, the qualities that we look for as a leader. Now, uh, in just a little while, we're going to close with uh, some housekeeping items today, and I'll turn things to your host. But uh, I want to go over just a couple of things to you because uh, when you come back next week for the final class, it's, it's really not a class like this. It's really more of a, of a lab. It's an interactive time because you'll have the opportunity to choose from over 30 different ministries uh, based on your interest and your passions and your abilities and especially on your giftings. Um, it's, uh, it's the final step because uh, once you make that choice, we'll help you to get on a team and uh, they'll ask you to fill out some paperwork at that time because they want to make sure that you're ready to step into those, uh, those places of service. But uh, I want to talk to you uh, on page 40 about our honor code at CLC. And I will tell you, as you read through this uh, today, it, it may look hard to you. It may look like we're asking an awful lot. But uh, we realize that we must strive to do what's right, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of man. Uh, because people are watching us. And that's why we agree to this honor code. I'm not saying, as you read this, we're not saying that, that any of us are perfect or that we... Uh, are right all the time, uh, because if we did that, I wouldn't be uh, up here teaching. I wouldn't be qualified to be your senior pastor, because none of us are perfect. But we should all be striving for these things. Um, and so in your, in your notes there, the honor code, uh, it tells us that you must refrain from certain things like profanity and uh, smoking or chewing tobacco and gambling indulging in much wine or other alcoholic beverages, uh, in dishonest gain, illicit drugs, pornography, all of those things, sexual immorality, all those things that are talked about. Uh, if, if you mess up in any one of those areas, uh, then I would just simply tell you to repent and ask God to forgive you and, and then work that out of you. That's, that's really what all of us have to do. Uh, that's what all of us should be asking him to do, to, to work in our lives. And so if you have questions as you read the honor code today, if you have questions about that, uh, you can address them uh, perhaps with your host or our, our, our uh, uh, growth track team today, or uh, certainly next week when you have the one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, the opportunity to meet with ministry leaders uh, you can discuss that with them. If you are ready you can go to do so, you can go ahead and sign the honor code today and say, I'm willing to take this step and say, I'm striving to live the kind of life that would not bring embarrassment to the Lord Jesus or to Christian Life Center. Okay, last page then, page 41. Uh, next week when you come back, as I said, it's not really a class, it's more of an interactive lab where you will have the opportunity to connect with a dream team leader. Uh, this is where uh, the growth track goes from being a, a classroom setting to a very personal uh, interaction, one-on-one -on -one conversation with one, our, one of our team members uh, with an orientation session to help you make a personal connection with that team. Now, all of our teams require some training. Uh, some of them, that training uh, is longer than others. If you want to 
to be on the stage playing a musical instrument or singing in the choir, it may take you a few months before you'll actually be on stage. Uh, if you want to serve as an usher or a greeter or in hospitality, something like that, uh, you, you might be involved on that team before the month is out. It's a much shorter process. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the deal is you get to choose based on your gifts, your passions, your callings. You get to choose and, uh, and, and then have the opportunity to serve others. You get trained and equipped to fulfill your purpose by serving on our dream team. Now, I want you to notice the last uh, statement in the book. I actually not want you to just don't just want you to notice it. I want you to, to declare this out loud with me, if you would, everyone. Because God has called me to serve my generation, I will value worship over wealth. We over me, character over comfort, service over status, and God's purposes over possessions, positions, popularity, and pleasure. To my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer in advance is yes. Wherever you lead and whatever the cost, I'm ready anytime, anywhere. I want to be used by you in such a way that on that final day, I'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in and let the eternal party begin. Amen. Can I pray for you now? Father, thank you for every person at every campus, every location of CLC that has traveled with us on this journey. And I pray, Lord, for the influence that you've placed inside of every one of them, that they would not let any excuse stand in their way, but that every man and woman in this class today will by faith Step out to use the gifts that you have placed inside them in order to fulfill the purpose for which they were created and make a difference in this world. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Your host is coming now.